As we open up our study of Philippians to chapter 3, we come to an interesting thing that Paul said. Uh, I, I love to read it and then talk about it because, uh, because uh, there are so many people misunderstand what Paul is saying here. Maybe the translators uh, didn't do us any favors with the words uh, that they chose, uh, but it, it turns out to be kind of a joke about those of us who are preachers. So let's just listen to verse 1. You'll understand what I mean. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. The word finally is what I was talking about when I talked about the joke about preachers. Uh, somebody uh, said about a preacher one time when he, when he used the word finally, somebody turned quietly to somebody else and said, what does that mean? And they said, not one thing. <laughs> and that is the way we sometimes view preachers. But here, Paul doesn't use really a word that ought to be translated finally. It would be better translated for the rest. I've got some other things that I need to cover, and that's what he's going into. This is not really the finally of this book. We'll see that in some ways later. But instead, this this is dealing with other matters that Paul felt needed to be dealt with at Philippi. Well, why does he deal uh, with those things? Well, he deals with them uh, because, in point of fact, he he wanted the brethren to rejoice in the Lord, and he instructs them that way. The word that he uses there is not just rejoice, but rejoice exceedingly, just overflow with joy. Where, Paul? In the Lord. And you're going to notice in this epistle, usually joy is in the Lord, and the rejoicing is in the Lord. That's where real joy and rejoicing are to be found. Uh, the same things, that's the, that's the wording used in the New King James Version, the same things he wrote about may be the rejoicing that had just been mentioned or the message which follows about those who would require Gentiles to be circumcised, which seems more likely since he had just been to Jerus the Jerusalem conference before his first visit to Philippi. As you may remember, Acts 15 is the Jerusalem conference. Acts 16, he goes to Philippi. And so he probably had already talked about this uh, when he came to Philippi. He'd already told them, you Gentiles don't need to be circumcised, even though that was required under the law of Moses. Uh, you don't need to be circumcised because in Christ uh, uh, you are set free. Uh, and and that is it is the only circumcision you need, the cutting away, as it were, of sinful deeds. And we'll see more about that when we look at the book of Colossians together. So it seems likely to me he's talking about circumcision, which he probably had already talked about to them. Uh, he wanted them to know that they didn't really mind repeating himself. Uh, instead, he used it as an aid to learning, uh, knowing that it would be something very much needed in order to uh, maintain the safety of their souls. And I think one of the things that preachers and teachers of the Bible need to keep constantly in the back of their mind is that repetition is a good thing. You may feel like you said the same thing over and over and over again, and that actually may be true, but almost every audience that we speak to is different. There's somebody there who may never have heard you say that before, and it's very, very important that we go ahead and repeat it so that the brethren who already know about it will be confirmed in their belief, and those that don't know about it will hear it now for the first time and be drawn to do what is right. So let's look at chapter 3, verse 2 of Philippians. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Uh, we think of dogs, at least uh, in the United States, we think of dogs as being a a friendly, you know, man's best friend, a pet, uh, someone to enjoy having around. But, but the Jews uh, did not. Dogs in in their day roved in packs, or roamed in packs, and they would attack the weak and the helpless. They would kill young children, 
Uh, they would attack older people, sometimes killing them as well. Uh, it's interesting that the Jews often referred to <clears throat> the Gentiles as dogs, and that was their way of putting them down. Uh, they were dirty animals, surely enough, in that day, uh, roaming the streets, eating garbage, and possibly attacking the weak. They were half wild and they were dangerous. And you see uh, something like that uh, in Psalm 22, verses 16 through 20. Uh, these that the apostles spoke of here uh, worked, but, but they worked to an evil end. Uh, they, they were actually striving to do things they should not ha have done. And you'll see that kind of thing in other places. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, uh, where they were delivering a doctrine totally contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Things like that are very, very clear. It appears here that Paul is referring to the Judaizing teachers who are trying to make Gentile Christians obey the law of Moses. And that's, a, that's something he dealt with before. Uh, as I said, you see it in Acts 15. You also notice the discussion of it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. There is some reference to it in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, they were asking Gentiles to, be, to circumcise themselves to be more pleasing to God, but it did not please God so it was only a mutilation of the flesh or a concision, not a circumcision, but a concision, a, a, a hacking, as it were, of the flesh, a tearing it up, mutilating it. And uh, that would not be appropriate for the Christian. So he goes on in verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Uh, the Jews used their fleshly circumcision to prove they were descendants of the faithful Abraham. The Christians are truly circumcised in baptism into Christ, uh, where the sins of the flesh are cut away, uh, and, the, and the new walk as a spiritual servant of God begins. As I said, that's in Colossians 2, 10 through 13, it's also talked about Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. God wants the inward commitment more than the outward ritual. And you see that in Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. God's true Israel, that would be the church, is, compared, is composed of those who worship him in spirit and in truth, think about his words to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, and some other matters he dealt with along the same order, Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9. The Christian's glory is not in the flesh or in outward works, but in Christ. And in fact, Paul talks about glorying in the Lord in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Uh, those who trust in the flesh try to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And they really reject Christ's assistance. They don't they act like they don't need it. You know, I'll just be circumcised. I'm going to be fine. That won't work. Uh, Jews had to be baptized just like Gentiles. And they need to learn that lesson. God never intended to accept mere outward ritual. In fact, he really wanted the heart all along. Turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 26. Uh, there uh, Moses is writing uh, the words that God revealed to him, and we want to pick up on a, a particular statement there uh, at Leviticus chapter 26, and we want to look at verse 31. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuary to desolation. I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. What's the problem? I mean, really, all those things would be done uh, to satisfy God, or at least theoretically to satisfy God. But the reality is uh, that they, they were not doing it to satisfy God, and God wasn't pleased with it. So think about any act under the law of Moses. It's only really pleasing if it is done 
uh, to satisfy God and, and his desire for them. Skip on down uh, to verse 40 in that same Leviticus 26. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, I'll remember the land. So, you hear what he's saying. All along, God didn't just want a mere external, formal, ritualistic service. Instead, what he really wanted was a commitment from the heart that is reflected in that outer <clears throat> ceremony that was conducted as they uh, submitted to the covenant and, and were circumcised. The males were uh, for that very reason. You can see that uh, similar references in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, also chapter 30. And you can see it in Jeremiah 4, 4 and Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. So Paul wants it known very clearly that the Judaizing teachers are going down the wrong road. Uh, God's not happy uh, with their, uh, their trying to require Gentiles to be circumcised. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a heart that has the sins of the flesh cut away. So look at verses 4 and 5 of Philippians chapter uh, 3, <clears throat> where he says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. Now, he's, he's stooping to their argument for a moment to show them, you know what? You all want to set yourselves up as the great keepers of the law. Let me tell you something. If you want to brag about that kind of thing, I could have bragged about that kind of thing. Uh, he is not putting down Judaism uh, because he had a low place in it. That's the point. No, he had a high place in it. He was a man who truly could have placed confidence in fleshly accomplishments if there was any value in that. And he begins to list those credentials to show the Jews just how high a standing he really had. Uh, he, the Ishmaelitish people were uncircumcised, or they were circumcised at age 13. And the proselyte was circumcised in well, in mature life, he proselyted when he was an adult, and that's when he was circumcised, uh, <clears throat> when he accepted Judaism. But Paul, Paul was circumcised by the law, the eighth day, just like God commanded. The apostle to the Gentiles was, a, was born a Jew and circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. He was an Israelite, that is, he was one of God's people, uh, and Paul says he was the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin and Joseph were Jacob's favorites. You may remember that. And uh, maybe that's part of why he brings that up. By the way, the first king uh, came from the tribe of Benjamin in the form of Saul uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and that tribe remained loyal during the rebellion of Absalom. It was really the only one that remained loyal to David and so it was a great tribe, and Paul came from that tribe. Uh, Paul said he was a Hebrew born of Hebrew parents. In other words, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Well, I'm a Hebrew because my mom and dad both were Hebrews. Uh, some were from a mixed marriage, not Paul. His, his parents were, were right down the line. He was a Pharisee, which was a sect that set up strict rules to live by. And you can see... Uh, some of that, of course, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 23, uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, when you look at Stephen's great sermon, uh, Acts 23 was part of Paul's uh, experience in Jerusalem when they took him captive, and he ultimately uh, ended up uh, on his way to Rome. And, and then also in chapter 9, you can see 
uh, that, that he was a Pharisee. His reputation for trying to keep every detail of that legalistic outer righteousness was blameless. He did everything he could do to be exactly right ritualistically and with outward things uh, under the law of Moses. Now he continues, he's not through yet, uh, telling us these, these various things uh, that, that he could say about himself. Look at verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He deserved no censure. He had lived as best he could, and when he found out he was wrong, he'd corrected it. Furthermore, he was zealous in the persecution of the church. And boy, anybody that's read the book of Acts knows of the great zeal of Paul in terms of persecuting the church. So, um, you know, Paul was no slouch. And if the, if the Judaizing teachers wanted to compare credentials, uh, Paul could do that uh, very, very easily. But listen to him in verse 7. Because in verse 7, he basically says, all of that is really not worth talking about. Listen to how he says it. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Paul had once counted himself a spiritual millionaire. Uh, at that time, at the time he wrote this letter, though, he saw himself as bankrupt before he found Christ. You see, uh, he didn't always know that Jesus was the Christ. He thought he was an imposter. He thought those people that followed him were following, well, a cult, a false religion. He'd come to realize, no, 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 it was he himself that was wrong and needed to change his life. He was spiritually bankrupt because he had never obeyed Jesus Christ. To become a Christian, he set aside uh, the pride of the self-made man that we can see listed above. And in place of that, he surrendered his will to the will of Jesus Christ. So pick up at verse 8, where he says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul forfeited or suffered the loss of all he once held dear and counted it a good swap for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he uses terminology here uh, that, uh, well, in King James Version, it doesn't use uh, rubbish. It says dung. It's, it's, uh, it's the waste of animals. And, uh, and Paul uh, indicates, you know, all that stuff that I counted so high and I thought so much of, but we might say those trophies that were on my shelf, why, they were like a pi pile of horse manure. They weren't worth anything, is the idea. Why? Because he needed to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that gain was the greatest gain in his life. Uh, Jesus says we can either deny self or forfeit self, if you would, and or be cast away. That's in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. I've either got to deny myself, or forfeit myself, or else I'm going to be lost. That's, that's just the simple way of looking at it. Uh, the words here, cast away and suffered the loss, come actually from the same Greek word. And when Shepard looked at it, uh, he said that knowledge is much more than intellectual. It includes faith, service, sacrifice, and it is analogous, analogous to the phrase to be in Christ. Uh, the spiritual knowledge by which the individual becomes one with Christ so that his whole life is lived in Christ and he has no consciousness of being apart from Christ. That's what Paul wanted. He wanted to forget all that stuff in Judaism. Why? Uh, because in Christ, he found great release, great freedom, and ultimately the path to heaven. The kind of knowledge that Paul wanted would grow as one grew in service of the master. The more he grew as one of the Lord's servants, 
the more his knowledge would grow. And I wonder how many of us find that to be true. The longer you serve God, try to be faithful in that, <clears throat> the more you seem to know and grow, as it were, in that knowledge. And that's what Paul said. He counted all that was once important to him as refuge, refuse, so that he might win Christ. And our ambition ought to be the same. We ought to be striving to win Christ. All right, verse 9 of uh, Philippians chapter 3, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. One must be baptized to be found in Christ. Uh, Paul talks about that in Romans 6. Let's look there briefly. Verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, see how you get into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So to be found in Christ, we're going to be baptized into Christ. Once he was in Christ, Paul ceased relying on personal accomplishments to save him. Instead, he was obedient, uh, which is generally the meaning of faith in the New Testament. Uh, in other words, faith, really the faith that saves is an active faith. You th take Abraham and look at what he did. He's described as one of the great faithful men in both Romans chapter 4 and also in Hebrews chapter 11. And really, in both cases, what we discover is that that faithfulness comes because he believes God and he does whatever God asks him to do, even to the point of being willing to sacrifice the son of promise, which has to be among the most remarkable things in all of Scripture. Kaufman said, the contrast is between trusting in the ceremonies of the law of Moses for salvation as contrasted with believing and obeying the gospel of Christ. And I think he's right on the money on that point. The only faith which God will count for righteousness is that which comes by obedient hearing of God's word. Think about this. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The faith of Christ would refer to the Savior's faithfulness or fidelity in carrying out God's plan for saving man. Aren't you glad Jesus was faithful? He did exactly what the Father wanted him to do. And because of that, we have an opportunity uh, to be saved. Note that he had to obey God to be truly faithful in carrying out God's will. We've already seen that. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Uh, <clears throat> we see it in the Garden of Gethsemane, as we looked at earlier in our study together, Matthew 26, 39. He put his hearing under uh, the law, under his father. Uh, and that is very, very important uh, for us to see, that he placed his hearing under the father. He did exactly what the father uh, wanted him to do. And when he put himself under the Father, he showed us that we too need to put ourselves under him uh, so that we can be saved. Very, very important. Our righteousness comes by Christ's faith in, in, in that we are cleansed by his blood. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of of sins. And so Paul is laying out a beautiful uh, argument here. He continues really in verse 10 uh, when he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. The apostle's ultimate goal was knowing Christ, which usually suggests an intimate relationship with someone. You think about Genesis 4, 1, it says, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son. Now, obviously, that means Adam and Eve had intimate 
relationships. Paul wanted to really, really know God. Well, he knew him uh, in the church, no doubt. He knew him on earth. But the greater knowledge, it seems to me, will be when we get to heaven, when we get to see him face to face and we get to worship him there. The Christian's purpose then is to know Christ, not nearly facts about him, but really come into an intimate relationship with him both now and in eternity. Christ's resurrection proves he's the Son of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 is clear on that. It is also the basis of the appeal that Paul makes here to obey him. He's been raised, therefore he's the Lord. And if he's the Lord, then what? I ought to submit to him. I ought to obey him in everything that I do. <clears throat> we can know the power of his resurrection by being buried with him and raised to walk in the new life. We've seen that somewhat in uh, Romans chapter 6. You can also see it in Romans chapter 8, verses 10 through 13. Salvation and hope depend on Christ's resurrection. And really, that's the argument of virtually the entire 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, but especially verse 17, which makes it very, very clear. Christ followers have fellowship. That is, they share or have in common Christ's sufferings. That's, that seems odd <clears throat> that you would bring that up, but it's true. When we live for Christ, we will suffer. Now, some of us, thankfully, have suffered very little uh, for our Christianity, but that's not true world over. Some are literally dying for the Lord today. They're being hunted down like animals and killed because they worship uh, Jesus Christ and God the Father. Uh, some are being persecuted for it. Some are thrown into prisons because of it. Uh, we suffer because we follow the Lord, and uh, though that may not be the case where you are or where I am right now, it always is possible because people in darkness don't like to see people in light. It reflects poorly upon them in, in a sense of the word. Uh, so we share with Christ in suffering. When we do that, uh, when we share in, in his suffering for righteousness, uh, then that will help us to be constantly dead to sin, uh, just as Christ died for sin, as we've seen in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. All right, let's look at verse 11, uh, because then he says, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul recognized the danger of failing to remain faithful. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, which refers to what happened to the Israelites in their journey. They had been delivered from Egyptian bondage, and yet uh, they were lost. They failed to enter the promised land. And so then the writer in Hebrews 3, 14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. It's ours if we hold steadfast. And that's the reason Paul used that. He knew that everybody would be raised from the dead. The Lord said that, John chapter 5, 28 and 29, the good under the resurrection of life, the evil under the resurrection of condemnation. Uh, Paul himself talked about it to some extent in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, when he talked about how everybody's going to have to stand before the judgment seat. We will be raised. Because Jesus was raised. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so the goal of attaining the resurrection must instead refer to his longing for the resurrection of the righteous to be with the Lord. Think 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where beginning in verse 13 he says, uh, But why would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not, even as others which have no hope? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What resurrection is Paul trying to attain to? Not just a resurrection from the grave. He wants the resurrection unto life, and he talks about it again, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, where he talks about the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give him in that day. That's what he longs for. That's what he lives for. And he challenges us to similarly devote ourselves not to worldly attainments, but instead to achieving the resurrection from the dead.